Michelle Marie McGrath. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Unclassified Woman. Today, I'm happy to be talking to the lovely Jennifer Miller in California. I really wanted to speak to Jennifer after I'd watched her film, A Womb with a View, which is freely available on YouTube. So check that out at the end of our conversation. Jennifer grew up in New Jersey and worked in various positions throughout her corporate career, which took her from New Jersey to Wisconsin and New York. She moved to California in 2002, where she later married her husband, Peter. In 2012, Jennifer completed her first feature-length documentary film, A Womb with a View, which I mentioned, which was screened at several film festivals, including the 2012 Santa Barbara International Film Festival. The film explored the lives of several women who either chose or evolved to not have children and how that impacted their lives. Hair Therapy was her second film, which she wrote and directed. It's about the relationship between hairstylists and their clients and how that transcends other relationships in our lives. Today, Jennifer is doing a lot of writing and is currently working on her novel. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation and I think you'll agree that Jennifer had so many interesting points to make about this very emotive topic. So hi Jennifer, delighted to have you here today and really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you Michelle, it's a pleasure to speak with you. And so just to give us a little bit of background, Jennifer, would you mind sharing a bit about yourself and whether you've not had a child due to personal choice or whether it's been more a combination of circumstances? Absolutely. Um, Basically, I was uh, one of five children and I grew up with absolutely the expectation that I would have children. I entered the workforce in my 20s and, you know, by the time I was in my 30s, I kind of was starting to suspect, hmm, is this going to happen or not? I also had uh, a lot of problems with uterine fibroids uh, through the years. And when I married my husband in my mid-30s, I kind of said to myself, you know, this, this might not be happening. And, you know, I needed to try to accept that. So what happened was uh, I had a hysterectomy when I was 39 for severe uterine fibroids and uh, a lot of pain. And I was looking forward to the relief of not having the pain anymore. What happened, however, was this unexpected grief that kind of overtook my life. Um, As I mentioned, I was, I was, coming to the acceptance that it wasn't going to happen. So there was kind of a choice there. But then when the hysterectomy happened and my u- my uterus was physically removed from my body, that choice no longer existed. And a lot of emotions came over me with that. And so I had to start looking deep within myself because quite honestly, I felt very worthless in that mm. time in my life uh, because so much of my self-worth was always in my ability to create another life. Now, this is not to say that I wasn't loved by my family or respected by them. But when you grow up in a large, you know, Irish Catholic family, a lot of women in the family, most of the women have children, you kind of have that expectation for yourself. So when the hysterectomy happened, and this grief kind of overtook me, I was really struggling. And one of the things that happened to me, Michelle, was a few weeks after the hysterectomy, I I was attending a party, and I was introduced to this man. And And he, uh, right out of the gate, you know, asked if I was married. So I told him yes. And then he asked if I had any children. And I told him no. And he said, well, why not? And I certainly wasn't about to tell the stranger that a week and a half ago I had a hysterectomy. All your most personal details. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I just simply said, you know, it was not in the cards. And he looked at me without any hesitation and said, well, you're never going to know true love. And from a complete stranger... I decided right in that moment, I said, I need to change this dialogue because Mm. this man was not the only person that made similar comments. You know, I've had dogs throughout the years and people would say, oh, you and your dogs. And it's just very dismissive, bordering judgmental. Really insensitive. Absolutely. And so 
because of that, I, I decided to make a film. Uh, the film is called A Womb with a View. And what I did was I, I sat down and I discussed basically how to make a documentary with a, a gentleman, a really dear friend of mine who is a filmmaker. And he told me what I needed to do, you know, learning how the camera work, doing the interviews, editing, post-production, all of it. I wrote it all down. And two years later, I called him up and I said, come watch my film. And, you know, long story short, he worked with me to complete it. But what I did, Michelle, was I interviewed 28 women who either chose or evolved to not have children. Because, again, I didn't want this to be uh, like uh, I wanted it to be a conversation. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted it in, in wanting to change the the dialogue in society. I wanted a gentle conversation, nothing forceful. Um, and so I wanted to show women who chose or evolved at, to not have children. And out of the 28 women, 18 of them were were in the film. And all of them have different reasons for why they didn't have children. Some, it just evolved. One woman, Lori, uh, was was a major caretaker for her grandmother who had Alzheimer's. Um, Sandhya was a, a neurosurgeon from India who refused to be uh, put into an arranged marriage, refused to be told who she was going to be. And in doing so, she had to really sacrifice a lot uh, by coming to America, changing, you know, just leaving her home and really saying, saying no to that expectation. Um, and it was, for me, an extraordinarily cathartic event because by creating this film, I kind of birthed my own creation and my own message to society and the world of you're not going to define me. Instead, I want to tell you why I am the way I am and who I am. Mm, extraordinary. And gosh, I was just thinking, and quite young to have a hysterectomy as well, really. That is a major operation. So I can only imagine, yeah, no wonder it brought up a lot of feelings of grief and mixed emotions around that. I mean, that is a huge thing to undergo. And, you know, fibroids, again, it's quite common, but again, something that is not really talked about that much. Absolutely. And they caused me, I mean, for, for most of my life, Michelle, I, I, I had horrible periods. I had horrible pain and it never went away and it only progressively got so untenable that I, I went to the to the doctor and she said, "Listen, I think you should have a hysterectomy." And I I said without hesitation, "Do it." And you know, she said to me, "I wish more women were like you." She said because so many women have your have fibroids like you, have pain like you, but they do not want to relinquish their uterus because mm -hmm. it so defines them as women. And by, if, by, by letting go of my uterus, I was able to let go of the pain. And so that was freeing on so many levels. And even emotionally, it was freeing. I wasn't tied to that expectation every single month of the weeks of pain. But as I mentioned, and as you just referenced, the emotional grief that followed was something that was really overwhelming. And so I needed to, de I decided I needed to take control of it, you know, make the lemonade, make, you know, and just make it a better situation and take control of it rather than it controlling me. Yeah. And really create a new narrative about it yeah. all. And especially through the creation of your film as well. And that must have been fascinating. Like, talking to all of those women from various backgrounds and Absolutely. yeah it's, it's just so interesting isn't it when you hear all these different stories and you realize you know there's just so many layers to this Absolutely. It is a very complicated thing. And it's a situation that it does not only exist in England or in America. I think this is a global situation. I mentioned in my film, uh, in Chad, a proverb says, a woman without children is like a tree without leaves. That mm. speaks a lot to that society. In yeah. Muslim cultures, Michelle, women without children are not always allowed to be buried in graveyards or sacred grounds. I find that very interesting. That's extraordinary, isn't it? And that really says a lot, doesn't it, about how the culture views the role of a woman. Uh, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Finally, I wanted to say in South India, because this is something that really spoke to me. In South India, a young, poor, childless woman, they've identified the most hurtful name that they are called, Machi, which is a word in Malayalam that has no English equivalent. And it refers to a farm animal that cannot breed. 
And for me, when I when I read that, I thought to diminish a woman like that simply because she has not had a child, it's almost unspeakable. Yeah. In my opinion, in my opinion, because I feel women have so much more to offer. We are by nature nurturing creatures. We nurture animals, nieces and nephews, friends, husbands, boyfriends, ourselves, the earth. We're, we're all mothers to so many things and yeah. we shouldn't be defined by that one ability, whether or not you've procreated or not. Absolutely. And yet it's extraordinary that there still is so much judgment. I mean, I do believe that there has been a shift and we are talking about these, you know, much more in the last few years, I've noticed it. But I mean, I don't know if it's just I've noticed it more because it's a topic that I've always been fascinated by. And it's something that I've always questioned is that assumption that, you know, when you grow up, you meet a nice man, you get married, you have a child Mm -hmm. and you all live happily ever after. And I never really was convinced that that was something that I necessarily was going to follow. And it's just that, you know, the frustration of just this. Yes, expectation. That, yeah, and that is right. what you will do, you know. And I think, Absolutely. like you mentioned, the religion often comes into it with a Catholic Irish background, which you Absolutely. know I've got that in my family as well. So it's it's that conditioning, and so much of it is unconscious. That pressure from family and friends it can be so un, unintended by them. They don't often realise the impact because they've not known any different. Absolutely. And sometimes I say to myself, maybe it's not judgment, but wonderment. (laughs) Maybe it's that it's just so different from what they know. You know, Judith was a woman that I interviewed in my film, and she comes from the Upper West Side or Upper East Side of Manhattan um, of Jewish faith. And she was married. and, And like you, she wasn't quite sure she wanted to have children. And she found herself pregnant and decided to have an abortion. And she lost all of her friends. And a lot of family members just literally cut her off for life because of that decision. And I I find that to be very powerful. It's a very powerful statement because it stems back to what my goal in wanting to redefine the conversation is there is so much more to women than that. Now, this is not to say every single woman that I interviewed, Michelle, had great respect and reverence for mothers and motherhood. Absolutely. There is, this is not to say that we don't appreciate mothers, that we, we don't love them and, and, and nurture. Most of my friends are mothers. Yeah. And, and, and it's this, so it, it's, that's the other misconception out there, I believe, that people see in wonderment, let's say, women who have not had children, and there's a perception that they don't like children. Yeah, I mean, I don't know anyone who doesn't like children, really. So it is one of those kind of weird bingos that they assume then that, oh, you obviously don't like kids. No, not at all. That's not it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, um, so it's really, it's fascinating, all these myths. And one lady in your film, I can't quite remember her name now, but one thing that really struck me that when she talked about was how she was abused as a child and she, you know, believed that if you were abused mm-hmm. as a child, that that meant that you may go on to abuse your own child. And so she didn't want to put herself in that situation, whereas... You and know. think about think about the power in that. She yeah. was 12 years old when she saw that news report. And when I interviewed her, she was in her 50s. And I you know, I know I believe she was in her 30s and 40s when she came to the conclusion that that was not the reason to not have children, but to carry that with her her whole life. Um again, no one knows what someone's been through. And no. you you never know what their story is and you know, Jane was severely abused by her mother. And to have that news report come on to say that, you know, people who have been abused will abuse their children. I mean, that's that's a very deep thing. Yeah. And again, it's so individual, isn't it? Because it really comes down to um, what the individual decides to do, you know, based on their own kind of the experiences that they've had, if they go on a healing process, if they're very self-aware, if they're working constantly to overcome these things, of course, they're not going to repeat that, you know, so it's just, again, it's one of those like sweeping generalizations or statements that can be so damaging in themselves, those assumptions that are made. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed, uh, A Womb with a View was selected in the 2012 Santa Barbara Film Festival. And we were we, we premiered and we were screened there. And after the screening, there was a Q&A. And um, I, I, I basically was able to answer some questions from the audience. And I read some things in, in the local newspapers after. And believe it or not, Michelle, s- s- several people came to me and felt that every woman in my film were selfish because they didn't have children, which I found fascinating because I worked so hard to change that dialogue and to show that they're, they are nurturing, they are loving and they've chosen a different path. But again, it goes back to that societal conception or misperception of if a woman doesn't have a child, then she's selfish. And I, I I think that it, that is changing. You know, you and I mentioned that we both grew up in the 70s. I believe that it really is changing. I would yeah. love to see it change faster. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that is really disappointing in hearing that is I know that, you know, I've heard sort of a number of women have confided about, you know, them making the decision to have abortion. And I know there was that lady in your film who had had mm-hmm. an abortion three times at different points in her life. But it's usually coming from a place of really trying to take responsibility for what is happening. And they're doing it from it's something that they've really agonized over. It's not something that's being taken lightly at all. No, not at all. Absolutely. And again, there could be an argument made that it's kind of selfish to have a child if yeah. you aren't financially ready, emotionally ready, spiritually ready. And um, absolutely, some of the women, the, the time that they took to decide whether or not to have a child, I think was admirable. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's very interesting. And, you know, the woman in my film who did have several abortions, she was judged very much by a lot of people. And I, I it made me sad because I think they missed her point. Yeah. She knew that she couldn't be a good mother, yeah. you know, and there's that there's that juxtaposition of several you know groups of different religions that say to women, you know, have the baby, have the baby, give it up for adoption, don't have the abortion. But these same groups politically don't want to support social programs to help single mothers. Yeah. yeah. So you see, you know, the they want them. Their argument. Absolutely. It's quite a large one because yeah. if you're going to push a woman to have the child, then we need socially to help her raise that child. And it's, uh, it's just an interesting perspective. It really is, isn't it? And so during that process, when you were carrying out all those interviews and you were editing it and going through, were there any sort of really common threads that you noticed or things that really surprised you that you weren't expecting? The common thread without was uh, almost every other one of them have told me that they had heard from someone in their life that they will never know what they heard it endlessly, that they would never know what true love is if they didn't have a child. And I think that it's just I, I believe genuinely that having a child is one of the most beautiful experiences a woman can have. It is not the only experience that a woman yeah. can have. Yeah. And, you're and, right. Uh, that is something that I know I've I've had that conversation endless times as well. That is something that comes up repeatedly um, as a comment to people. And it's just, again, it's one of those things. It's so abstract as, as in like you can't measure one person's experience of love against somebody else's. You just it's Absolutely. just it's unquantifiable like so Absolutely. it's it's rid- a ridiculous statement yeah it's something that people hear all the time Exactly. And I can speak for myself. I am an aunt to many children. Um, I'm very close to these. I I call them children. Most of them are adults now. Um, They're having their own children. And, you know, the love that I gave to them is is no less than a love a, a mother would give to their child. Again, Michelle, this is not to say I understand motherhood is an an exhausting process that, you know, takes it's all consuming. And I understand that, you know, when you don't have children, you certainly do have more time to, you know, to think about things and to to go on trips and stuff like that. But I, I think that my my the thread that I'd like to point out is all women are nurturing creatures and uh we, we all have a lot to give society. And there's something to be said about being an aunt or being a friend, 
being a friend to children who are not their parents, yeah. you know, being someone that a, that a kid, a teenager or a young child can come to confide in that to say things that they might not feel comfortable telling their own parents, but they can come to you as somebody in their life who they can trust and can give them an alternate perspective than one of, of a parent. Absolutely. And I was just thinking about a friend of mine actually in Australia, um, Amanda Rootsy, who she's, she, you know, is not having her own children, but she's actually a youth mentor and mentors teenage girls all around self-esteem. And that's been very successful, her program. She's actually got a book coming out um, later on this year, but it's also, it's, she's done so well with it, but that she's then ended up training other women to mentor young girls as well. So I just think there's so many examples of where yes. women are really supporting children and young people in other ways. Absolutely. And, and creating, creating other things. Uh, several women in, that I interviewed wrote, one wrote a book, another one uh, actually wrote several books, and she's also uh, a hypnotist and a healer. And yeah. she goes on speaking engagements all over the world to, to show people, you know, ways that they can heal holistically, you know, and that's, that's something that is a beautiful gift to be able to give to people. Yeah. And it, and, and, and it just shows that, a woman's worth is not only in her ability to have children. No, and I think it's really all about disrupting this myth that motherhood right. equals womanhood. It doesn't, it's one expression of it. Of course, it's important, you know, absolutely. But it isn't the only form of expression in that way. And we are naturally creative beings. We, we just are. We, we, you know, everything about us is there's a cycle, you know, um, there's a creative naturally cycle. creative and yeah. naturally nurturing Na you know, we, we are that. So, uh, to be confined to the one thing I just think is, is wrong. And like I said earlier, I, I try to put a positive spin on it instead of judgment. I like yeah. to look at it as wonderment because yeah. it's just, if it's different, if someone is different, then there's that hesitance. And that's, you know, I think we evolved to be that way. Um, but now I'm hoping that we evolve further to understand that there's room for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And that there's everybody has different gifts and abilities and qualities to share. And it's just not every woman's path, even if that's what you really wanted. Sometimes exactly. it's just not possible. And we don't always know the reasons why. I mean, so many women have inexplicable infertility or they just don't meet a partner during that window. And that, again, Correct. is increasingly common. You know, I know so many women, they've got so much going for them. They've got full lives, but then they didn't meet a partner at the time when they would have been able to, you know, have Absolutely. that fertility window. So, again, you just just don't know, do you? You don't know. And I think for so for those women who evolved, it's, you know, I know a, a lot more of them today are freezing their, their eggs and stuff. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking and hearing you speak, I was thinking about a woman in my film, Sandia, who was a neurosurgeon, who refused to be put in an arranged marriage. And when she when she realized that the expectation was immediately for her to have a child, she knew that she did not want that. And I, I admire that courage because yeah. I feel, I feel like there's a lot of courage in women who say no to it. There's sympathy. I have sympathy for those who evolved because I kind of evolved. And yet I, I have um, admiration for those who chose it because I, I, you know, to come right out and say, no, I'm not having them. And here's why it is not a selfish act at all. In fact, it's a very courageous one. It is. And wow. I mean, just imagine the pressure that she must have felt. Firstly, to have an arranged marriage, right. um, which is a big enough deal on its own. And then to have that further expectation of knowing that that was expected um, straight away. I mean, and for her to basically turn her back on all of that, which is, it's basically, you know, it's the tradition, isn't it? And the expectation of, gosh, so how did her family take that? How did she navigate that? That's I know huge. that she's still absolutely, and I think it was many years of of acceptance with her family. Mm. Um, I know now that she, you know, she just went. I saw on social media that she was just visiting uh, her family back in India last year. But Sandhya's journey has been a long one, and and it's it's just it's. 
I, I admire her conviction so yeah. much. You know, one other thing I wanted to bring up, I was speaking with a woman one day, because this, this speaks to Michelle, the variables. Yes. There is no one story. Yeah. And one woman that I was speaking with had a younger sister who was severely developmentally challenged. And the the efforts that it took her parents to raise this child were extraordinary. And it was very sad. And the child died very young. And this girl said to me, I knew that I did not want to have a child because I feared that happening, which again speaks to you never know what someone's story is. And right. and I, I wish that people would actually stop asking, do you have kids? <laughs> because yeah. it's sometimes for the women that chose, absolutely, I'm sure they would have no problem explaining why they didn't have kids. But for those who evolved, you never really know. And sometimes it's very sad, the reasons why, you know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, again, it's this, we really need to change this whole the thought process around how this is just chit chat and small talk and like an icebreaker because it's not talking about the weather Um, it's so personal and uh, funny actually a friend and I were talking about this the other week and she said she went through this phase where she noticed it like when she was in a taxi if she was on like a long taxi journey for example it would come up and I remember being in France actually a few years ago with my partner and I was in a taxi on my own um because I we kind of left it on different days and when I got in the taxi the taxi driver was asking me all about the trip and who I'd been there you know who was I there with and just chatting and then he said so no children then Mm. and I said no Mm. And I started talking about something else and he came back to it and said, so no children, no children at all then. And I said, no. And I just thought, wow. And I literally, I deliberately didn't explain or justify anything because I thought it's really none of your business. I'm in a cab for God's sake. Absolutely. And I I think that response was brilliant. Yes. It's amazing. It really is. I, I, Yeah. It really is amazing. I, I'm almost speechless that he kept coming back to it. Yeah, so it's it's just, it's really, but that that's only like a couple of years ago. And I thought, gosh, it's just ridiculous. Like it's his constant. Um, when I was in my 30s, Michelle, it was almost constant. It yeah. really was. It was a constant thing. Now that I'm in my late 40s, I am finding, for better or worse, that um, it's coming a lot less at me. Um, and also, I think that's, two, there's a re- two reasons for that. One is that I am getting older, but secondly, I own myself a lot more and I hold my head up high a lot more. And like you in the cab, I don't need anybody's judgment and that judgment is not going to penetrate. So you know what? No, no kids. And I kind of don't leave room for any follow up now. Whereas back in my thirties, I felt so small and so yeah. judged and so oh my gosh i'm just i'm not who i was supposed to be when in reality i'm exactly who i was supposed to be because what i can offer is something different and unique not better or worse just different and unique to society to my nieces and nephews to my friends yeah so true so true and as you said we just we never know what all these variables are in somebody's life and it's just kind of insensitive really I feel to even ask I would never even raise it with somebody you know if somebody wants to talk about that topic I let them raise it I never raise it I just would never ask a woman that that I just met because you don't know if they've been having IVF for 10 years (laughs) like exactly you really don't know Right, exactly. And I think that's kind of the gift that you and I can take away from not having children is that compassion yeah. and approach that I, same thing, Michelle, I never, ever ask. I rarely ask what someone does for a living. I just find it's too personal. Yeah. And also I never ask if they have kids. It's And it, like you said, if they want to share with me, absolutely I'm willing to speak about it. But um, it's just not something I, I, I ask right away. No. And so it's, you know, as we have been saying, it's just not the role of every woman to be a mother at all. I mean, who knows? And even if it is a biological ability, so many choose not to because they know that it's not right for them. It's just not Mm -hmm. something that they feel a strong urge or calling for. So, which is very unselfish. Yeah. And very responsible. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think some people, again, as we said, people want to call them selfish. To me, that is the most unselfish act you can make. 
Yeah, ex- exactly. It really is. And yet we don't ask women, like, you know, you'd never go up to a pregnant woman and say, why are you having a child? What's your Absolutely. motivation? Absolutely. You know? Have you really exactly. thought about this? Have you thought <laughs> deeply? Or is it just that you're a product of social conditioning because all of your friends exactly. are having one and you're a certain age? Like, you'd never say that to somebody. Never. never. <laughs> you exactly. know, it's just kind of, but the reverse is just so common. And yet, in some ways, even more ridiculous, you know, so... <laughs> It's just, it really is kind of baffling how unconscious so much of this bias is really. And it's, it's you know, and thousands of years of uh, conditioning. Absolutely. And it needs to change. As I mentioned earlier to you, um, in, in, a, in a 2014 U.S. Census, 47.6 women between the ages of 15 and 44 in the United States have not had children. Yeah. Yeah. That's a large number of women. And that's why the dialogue really does need to start to change. Yeah. And if we think about how just in the last 10 years, women age 40 and over, the number without kids has doubled. Um, it, that is extraordinary, really. That is extraordinary, yes. It really is. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more of, um, yeah, more and more of these sort of different types of family groups. And it really speaks to what your definition of family is as well. Absolutely. It's not always blood relatives. Absolutely. And, um, and, and again, I, I go back to the global aspect of it because I feel like we're, we're very lucky living, you know, you living in England, me living in America, yeah. you know, birth control is available for so many women here, you know, in a lot of third world countries, that option just doesn't exist for a lot of women. And I would, I would bet anything that there's some women in, in these countries that might not want to have children, but that yeah, but choice just simply choice. doesn't exist. Yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly. why the work of people like Marie Stopes International is really important because they are all about um, working in places where people don't have access to contraception, any kind of, you know, birth control, any sort of assistance. So I just think, wow, imagine like you don't even have the choice. The choice. Exactly. Exactly. In this day and age, to have agency or any control really over your own body, whether you do, whether you don't. And yeah, it's it's really extraordinary in this day and age. I have to agree. It really is. And that's why I have a lot of gratitude that I do live where I live because it, I think I, I just have a lot of sympathy for those women. But it is a, a wonderful thing to hear that there's organizations out there trying to help them. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Jennifer, what do you feel is something that you're going to be focusing on projects for the future? Anything else creative that you're birthing right now or that's percolating? What do you what do you think you'll focus on? Because obviously you created that film. So I'm guessing that you are very expressive and creative. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. I did make a second film, actually, um, about the relationship between hairstylists and their clients called oh. Hair Therapy. And because uh, basically one day I was having a, you know, a rough day and my hairdresser came over and she did my hair. And when she left, I, w- I said to myself, gosh, I feel wonderful. And I realized it was her. And I realized that People say things to their hairstylists that they don't even say to their priests. They are Michelle. seriously like counselors. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I, I made this lovely, much lighter, obviously a lighter subject, um, uh, just celebrating hairstylists. It's called hair therapy, Brilliant. which was and that's a wonderful exercise. I also wrote um, a, a, a TV series. Um, nothing's come of it as of yet, but uh, it's about uh, two best friends. One of them has children. One of them does not. And they own a food truck. And there's, uh, of course, a dog uh, that they that is with them named Fergus. And they go and solve mysteries. Mysteries, uh, <laughs> the traveling Chatoria. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was that's that was a lot of fun. I wrote several episodes, and I'm still following up on that. And basically, I'm I'm writing. I'm interested. I'm, I began writing a few months ago a novel. Uh, I'm thinking of Fran Lebowitz, who said, "You know, never write about your family. It's never as interesting to anyone else as it is to you." <laughs> but I, uh, I I would love to write a novel just about a, a large Irish 
Catholic American family uh, because I think uh, it could be a lot of fun because there's so many different characters. So I still create today. Um, I know that I, I enjoy my life with my husband. Mm. I love my relationships with my girlfriends. Um, and again, most of them being mothers, but um, the give and take of that. And you know, I love being an aunt to my nieces and nephews. So I feel like I'm, I'm constantly creating. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, thank you. That's been wonderful. So great to talk to you and really enjoyed hearing your perspective. And it's interesting, actually, through this podcast, I've just connected with so many amazing women around the world and you realize um, how much you have in common, actually, as well, despite all of the, you know, the different steps on the path that might have brought somebody to a certain point. There's just absolutely, there's a common thread. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was my pleasure. And I really want to thank you, Michelle, for your interest in me and for allowing me this platform to share my thoughts. No, absolutely. And so the easiest way then for anyone listening who would like to watch your film, A, a Womb with a View, and also your other film that you just mentioned. So do you have a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube channel. Um, it, it, my name is obviously Jennifer Miller. And if yeah. you just search on YouTube for A Womb with a View, Jennifer Miller, and Hair Therapy, Jennifer Miller, they will come up. And oh, Brilliant. Um, and Wonderful. I will include yes. the links actually as well in the blog post. So that makes Wonderful. it a bit easier. So that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to hearing more about what you're creating in the future. Thank you so much, Michelle. You have a wonderful day and thank you again. Thank you for listening to Unclassified Woman. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. For information on events and services, connect with Michelle at michellemariemcgrath.com.